Thank you very much uh, to the organizers and of course uh, our hosts here in La Salle. Uh, I'm not often here in this side of uh, Manila, but I always cherish the opportunity to visit our uh, friends in La Salle. Um, I actually have a PowerPoint. I don't know if they're going to be able to load it. Um, but what, what I wanted to tell, uh, first of all, before I begin, can I have a raise of hands who is from Luzon, from this group? Okay, good. Luzon is well represented. Who is from Visayas? Okay, a few hands, good. Uh, even if you're studying in Manila, but you're from Visayas, you can raise your hand, right? Who is from Mindanao? Good. Actually, and of course, our own Dean Tony Lavinia is also from Mindanao, well represented. Ideally, we would like to see actually uh, good representation of young people in these events from uh, all over the country because that's the theme for today's event is building an inclusive democracy. Um, I don't have a clicker, so I'll just say uh, go ahead uh, to the uh, sort of uh, person who's manning the PowerPoint, please. I'm going to go straight to uh, the presentation, which is really just to show you this discussion on political dynasties. I'm sure you've heard uh, one thing or the other about this uh, particular issue, but uh, it seems it's going to be a very, very important issue again in 2016 for the same reasons it was already important before, 2013 and, and uh, before that. So I just want to give you an example. Usually the uh, reason that people say political dynasties have an advantage, which is that they have a long runway for reforms. If you are a political dynasty, you can actually implement reforms continuously. And the example that people usually give are the, is basically Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore. Uh, that's the picture of Lee, a young Lee Kuan Yew uh, immediately before he became prime minister. And of course, he's holding his son, who is now the prime minister of Singapore, took over from his father, right? Now, this is the prototypical example of, okay, a dynasty can actually do a lot of good. He's the example people give. In the Philippines, it's slightly different. Let me give you another slide. We also had a dynasty during those times. Just about the time when Lee Kuan Yew took over, uh, we had this particular family. And in fact, their family is still in office right now, family members. Uh, I count a congresswoman, a governor, another congresswoman, and a senator in that bunch. And of course, uh, that guy standing up uh, used to be our president. Right? Now, most of you uh, are not uh, from this era, so let me describe a little bit uh, what was going on during this era of this particular dynasty. An extreme concentration of political power, which was then used to influence also economic power. Right? Next, click, please. So, typically, a dynasty has these two main elements uh, a monopoly of political power and a lot of discretion. The problem with the monopoly of political power and a lot of discretion is if you do not have accountability, the end result is typically a lot of corruption, right? So this is really the difference between a Lee Kuan Yew and a Marcos. Monopoly plus discretion with a lot of accountability in the Singapore case, very little accountability in our case. So what was the result? I'll just give you a few examples. I, it actually... Uh, this is one example typically uh, given as a big white elephant project during those times, the Bata Bataan nuclear power plant. I don't know if you all are familiar with this particular project, but for those of you who are suffering brownouts or power outages right now in your homes, part of the challenge that we inherited from really bad policies from before is that some of our public sector investments did not pan out. This is one really classic example. It costs us $150,000 a day in principal payments alone, this particular project. Next, please. And total price tag, 120 billion pesos. This is calculated in real terms, translated into our currency. So what is the effect of this? Next click. Total output, zero kilowatts, not even enough for a light bulb, for a 120 billion peso project. And this is equivalent to 150,000 classrooms that could have been built back then. More than enough to supply the classroom gap for the country had that particular public investment been made. 
So this is the cost of a lot of monopoly of power and discretion without accountability, a lot of wasted public funds. This is why Matuwid na daan is so important to us today, that we don't suffer from these kinds of wasted opportunities and really costly projects that our country can scarcely afford. Next slide. There's some good news, and this is the slide I wanted to show you. A Marcos aide was actually arrested and convicted recently in New York. I don't know if you heard about this. This, was ju this just happened last year, actually, trying to sell a Monet painting in the New York art market for 32 million US dollars. This is a secretary of the former first lady. Arrested, of course, by the US authorities and convicted, and based on a recent update by the PCGG, next click, please. Uh, basically, the update is that four billion out of an estimated 10 billion of ill-gotten wealth has already been recovered by the Philippine government. Of course, that's already a minor victory, but of for those of us who are <laughs> thinking, well, the 10 billion, we should have gotten all of it back. We only got 40% of it some 25, 30 years later. So of course, that's a lot of money that was the product of corruption that can continue to corrupt institutions. So guess where this Monet painting sold for $32 million would have been going, right? So just a little bit cr of creativity and you can already think, oh, okay, they must have been mobilizing resources, right? So this is the risk, right, of one political dynasty. Fast forward to today. Next slide. The post marcus era is characterized actually by the rise of many, many dynasties and many dictatorships in uh, the Philippines, spread across our country. So there's no longer that one main political dynasty really just concentrating all the power. If you go to the different provinces across the country, and there are dynasties in all of our provinces, by the way, uh, you will see this concentration of power at that micro level, right? So uh, before I describe the next slides, I just want to mention that the other seemingly new a trend is the rise of many fat dynasties. What do we mean by fat dynasties? This is really a category whereby sabay-sabay silang tumatakbo. Dati kasi may konting delikadesa. Yung tatay, papalitan ng anak, pero hindi sila sabay tatakbo. Maghihintay yung anak na magre-retire yung tatay bago papalit. Ngayon po, sabay-sabay na talaga silang tumatakbo. And you can see that in many of our local government uh, situations today. Governor, advice governor, mag-ama, mayor, advice mayor, mag-ina. These are the situations that we observe. Next slide, please. So, I'll just give you one example, Maguindanao, in the news recently, due to Mamasapano, which is in the province of Maguindanao. In the last elections, I'm sorry, it got messed up a little bit. Can you click and see if it gets fixed? Oops, just go back to it then. It uh, doesn't get fixed. Sorry, sorry about that. Just go to Maguindanao. 77 Ampatuans ran for office in 2013, according to a Rappler report. You want to know how many Ampatuans actually won in 2013? 23. That's a pretty good batting average for 77, right? 23 Ampatuans, and unfortunately, it's not showing there. Uh, I apologize for this probably because of the Mac software. But uh, the Ampatuans have six mayors, four vice mayors, and 13 councillors in the family, right? Next slide. Another province with a lot of dynasties is the Nagat Islands, and I apologize for this. It's supposed to show what we call the pizza pie of political power, and that circle is supposed to show different slices. So for those of you interested, I'll just share the, so uh, the, the soft copy of this later on uh, with the organizers, and you can actually uh, look at it at, from, from your own computers. But essentially, uh, the Ecleos dominate uh, the Dinagat Islands in the same way that the Ampatuans dominate Maguindanao. Next click. You will see here that the Ecleos have one governor, one vice governor. So the mother is the governor. Yung anak po niya na lalaki ay vice governor. They have three mayors, two councillors, and two, pro two provincial board members. Now, for those of you who are studying political science in this group, what is the problem of having a provincial board member and a governor in the same family? Anyone? They're supposed to be the check and balance of our local government system. The provincial board is supposed to review the activities and budget of 
the executive, which is the governor uh, who is now managing at the provincial level. Now, if you have relatives in the provincial board, then that's really sort of a confusion of checks and balances already and a possible abuse of this. Next slide. What can you see in the Nagat Islands? What have they done with the monopoly of political power and the exercise of discretion? Did they actually make the Nagat Islands progress like Singapore? Did they actually use all that power for uh, the betterment of their people? No. And in fact, this is the view that will welcome you when you're going to the port of the Nagat Islands. I went there for a summer vacation actually a few uh, months back. You will see many fishing villages uh, actually in, in the front of the port, right? Really poor uh, families live there. And on the top of the hill, you will see a rather big house, which is estimated to cost about 300 million pesos, right? And the house looks like a castle. In fact, the locals call it the White Castle, right? Ito pong White Castle na to, dyan po nakatira ang kanilang governor. Next click. That's what the White Castle looks like up close, <laughs> right? So they always like to give this example of Makati City and the shanties near Makati as an example of inequality, economic inequality. Well, actually, the economic inequality is now well visible all over the country, even in the countryside. Here, the political inequality is very much linked to the economic inequality in this particular province. And so that's actually the parting message that I want to convey to you today. I don't have uh, so much time to deliver this talk, but the reason why economists and development practitioners such as myself, Tony Lavinia, July Tihanki, Professor Winnie Monsod also did a study on this uh, with Professor Toby Monsod, uh, in fact, is quoted in our study. The reason why we are studying this is because the politics and economics of it is now sort of melding. The inequality in the political sphere, the dominance of some families in our political sphere, is showing up and infecting the economic sphere. It is showing up in the lack of ambition of some of our economic policies. It is showing up in the extreme concentration of wealth in some of our industries. It is showing up in the lack of uh, aggressive reforms that could generate more jobs for young people such as yourselves. And this is the challenge that we face today. The TOR was to describe to you the challenge that we face. Let me leave you with this last slide. And this, I think, is the most problematic image that I can deliver to you today. This is a line. A day after the 2013 elections, somewhere in Manila, I'm told that we are in the city of Manila. Right? Uh, the line is outside of the newly elected mayor's house, right? And what do these people want? They are looking for a balato. Now, for those of you who are not Filipinos, a balato is sort of a reward given by someone who just wants something. So if you want the sweepstakes, you want the lottery, you want some gambling bet, typically all of the community is looking for some kind of libre or some kind of balato, right? Typical po yan sa kultura natin. This group of people is they are looking for a balato from their newly elected mayor who is a convicted plunderer, right? And want to know that the most dis disturbing part of this image, if that is not disturbing enough, please next click. That's a child lining up also. So my hope, and I will begin to end the presentation here today, is that the young people will actually try to think about these issues more deeply and try to convince fellow young people that we can ambition more as a country, that we cannot just line up for balato from people who are concentrating economic and political power, that the true future of this democracy and this economy is that the power should reside in the people. Kaya nga people power, di ba? That was the original hope. Thank you so much for listening.